some good worship right there. Good songs. And uh, I like that long song. To break every chain. Every one of us has chains that bind us, that hold us down. A lot of times we try to not look at those chains and think that's not really an issue for me when we really know it is an issue for us. And we, the way we get through that is we get through that by working on our salvation, by living for God, for applying His Word to our life, for staying in the right relationship with Him. And by doing that, that power of the Spirit is able to enable us to, to let go of those things and move on and to be free in Christ. We got uh, Ephesians 5 today. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians 5, there's quite a bit of information in Ephesians 5. My general custom is I preach a whole chapter at a time, so I won't be able to cover it as in-depth as I could. I think we could go on Ephesians 5 for maybe uh, three or four months if we really <laughs> broke it down with every Sunday. But we're going to sum it up here, and there's some great stuff in Ephesians 5, I'll tell you. But uh, we'll, we'll read the first, first uh, verses, the first 21 verses, and then I'll break this down for you. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is life, is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. All right, so there's a lot of stuff right here, as you can see. And from just the outside picture right here, it would seem almost like a legalistic chapter right here. There's a lot of do's and don'ts we have going on right here. But uh, don't worry, there's, there's a part coming up about being, being, being filled with the Spirit. We just read that, it said in verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit is not a legalistic thing at all. That's something that just happens right there. And I want to do an illustration with you guys. So hold up your hand like this. Is this your hand right here? And if, you, and if this would be the Holy Spirit, we would be the glove that would go on top of it right there. So just picture putting your glove on right there. Pretend you're putting a glove on. Sometimes like, <coughs> illustrations like this will help you remember what we talked about today later. And, and uh, basically being filled with the Holy Spirit is we are like the glove and the Holy Spirit is like the hand controlling us right there. And how do we be filled with the Holy Spirit? By, by giving ourselves up to God, by being saved, by having salvation right there. Every single person who's saved has the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as what some people say, like, I, I'm saved now, I'm going to get the Holy Spirit later and all this. When you are saved, you have the fullness of the Spirit within you. There is no difference right there. And the Holy Spirit is what should be behind us, controlling us, making us able, enabling us, doing all those things so that we can do all these things right here. Without the Holy Spirit, without being saved, we're not going to be able to do all these things right here we're going to talk about. But, and we'll go back here to the beginning. It talks about being imitators of God. And uh, as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And when we read through the, uh, we read through the sacrifices of the Old Testament, every sacrifice of the Old Testament is built on what Jesus was going to do when Jesus was sacrificed for us. There's actually an in-depth 
portion on this. So if you want, you can give me later, I'll really help you to see it right there. But all the sacrifices were built on this. Some sacrifices were as a fra fragrant offering, like something that God loved, something that God liked right there. When they were just offering a, a, a sacrifice to God. So like the sacrifice for sin, the sacrifice for doing wrong, God never said he liked that. There was never anything that God appreciated that or liked it. You know, God doesn't want us to be disobedient that we need to sacrifice. But as he refers to Jesus, Jesus is the sacrifice that, that was a fragrant offering, was a wonderful offering. Why? Because Jesus paid all that price for our sin on the cross right there. And he himself became our sacrifice for us so that we could make, be made right with God. And uh, there's a good story about uh, Benjamin Franklin. It says here, be imitators of God. When Benjamin Franklin first started using his light bulb and doing his light, he said this was handy so people would not stumble in the dark and fall over things and different things. The next thing you know, as he started to use his light and shine his light, other people were like, I want to use that light too. I, want, I need it. I want to use it. And it spread. And this is the same way we should be, as we're being imitators of Christ. And we're letting our light shine in the world. Our light should be spreading and other people will see that too. And then they'll start to become imitators of Christ. And their light is going to shine in the world. And it says here though, in verse 3, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetous must not even be named among you. We can't have these kind of things among us. You know, the Bible refers a lot to sexual immorality and to all kinds of stuff about sex constantly. Why? Because we live in a human body, in flesh. And maybe that's the thing that we're most drawn to, the most that we're weakest to as a, as a whole human race right there. And it says it shouldn't even be named among us. We should be put it out from us. We can't be living a life saying we're right with God, and yet we're being sexually immoral at the same time. It doesn't go together. And it must not even be named among you. If, if, if the world's watching us to be imitators of Christ for them to follow us, and they're seeing some kind of impure stuff with us, what is that going to do but just completely... Uh, annihilate our witness, or annihilate our, our stance for God. If we're not, we're not uh, standing up being unashamed of the gospel when we're standing in sin and we're standing for Christ, because that's just making us look like hypocrites. And the rest of the world, and most people don't like the church because of two things. They say they're a bunch of hypocrites and all they want is our money right there. So we want to try to do our best not to be a hypocrite, to stand strong and stand right and live righteously, live the way God has told us to live right here. It says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So we shouldn't be telling dirty jokes, and we shouldn't be talking crazy talk, and we shouldn't be, you can picture, I can totally picture talking about some story that happened in the past or something, and you're in a restaurant, and people are overhearing it, and they don't hear the rest of the good God talk that you're talking about, or the righteous things. They just hear this crazy story you just told, and they think, what kind of a person is that right there? You know, we aren't to have those kind of filthiness or crude jokes and things like that. We're to be, a, you know, we're ashamed of that stuff. So that stuff was sin that brought us down, that dragged us down. When we got salvation, we believed in Jesus. We've been forgiven of all that sin. That's not a good thing. It's nothing to glorify. It's something that, yes, we can use it for an example when we're helping people at times, different things. But it's nothing to be boasting about. That was the thing that was leading us on the way to hell. And when we found Christ and everything, now we're on the way to heaven, the path to heaven. So we should put that stuff behind us. And we really should watch how we speak. If we're speaking in an awful, crude manner all the time, how are we going to draw anybody to Christ with that crude manner? And even if draw, not drawing people to Christ, but for our own selves, when we're speaking all those things, that's just going to be hurting us on the inside also. It's going to be keeping us from the right relationship with God that we should be in right there. It's going to be separating us. So we have to watch our mouths, we have to watch our tongues and watch what we say. In the book of James it talks about a tongue is the rudder of a ship that controls the whole ship. If that rudder right there is, is off and already talking all kinds of crazy, foolish, awful talk, the whole ship's going to be going in wrong directions right there. The power of the tongue is amazing. But it said instead, what should you do instead of all that stuff? Be thank give. It said, let there be thanksgiving right before verse 5. You know, be thankful. Thank God. Praise God. Thank Him for what you got. Be a thankful person. Don't be a person that's a complainer. Be a person that's a thankful person there. And it said, well, I got a story about that too, with Thanksgiving. It's, there's once, a, there was once a, a, a woman, and they called the chaplain in, and they said, chaplain, this woman is about to die, and we think that you should go and you should comfort her. And, he, and they told her this awful situation. She had, didn't have two pennies to rub together. She was dirt poor. She had some disease. She was going out of the world. Every bad circumstance you could imagine was upon this woman. And when the chaplain came and he talked to her, he said, woman, how can I help you out? How can I, 
how can I be assistance to you? And she said, don't worry. She goes, she goes, I've got it all. I have everything I ever wanted because I have Christ in my life. And I could ask for no more than that right there. And the woman had nothing to the outside world, to the non-believer. They would just feel shame and pity for the woman. Think, what does she have? She has nothing. But she said, was just happy. She was satisfied. She was joyful. And she was giving thanksgiving even in the moments before she passed away into death. That is the type of picture and image where we should be with Thanksgiving. And it says, it says here, it's very clear, it says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral and pure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to take you over to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 includes a lot of the same things it talks about here in the same chapter. But it says there is no inheritance in the kingdom of God. So if these kind of things are dominating your life, right there, and Christ is not dominating your life, you may be part of 1 Corinthians 6, 9. God forbid, we don't want that right there. We want to cling close to God and hold, hold strong to Him right there. But 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Or do you not know that the unright unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's a whole bunch of things right there that it puts on there. A whole lot of sin that is a very common type of sin in the world today has always been in the world of humanity right there, where common says, but it says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to heaven. If your God is one of those things right there, and your God is not Jesus Christ, and this stuff completely dominates your life, you're not on the path to heaven right there. You're still on the path to hell. Even if somebody told you that you could say a prayer and walk away and live like the Dickens right there, you're not going to heaven right there is what the Bible says. It's much more than a prayer. It's a relationship. It's a life-changing experience. It's a true repentance of salvation that no longer am I lost and my God is all those things I just read about, but my God is Jesus Christ and I'm going to be imitating Him, following Him, serving Him. That does not mean that I'm, uh, that I'm not going to fall down, that some of those sins aren't going to happen right there along the path right there, but those sins are not going to dominate me. Those sins are not going to be my idol. My idolatry is like whatever is your God in life. What is the most important thing to you? In America, most people, the most important thing to them is money. Everything is driven by money. And that is their God right there. And ultimately, they're going to die. And they're not going to take a penny with them right there to their death and to their grave. But there's all kinds of people that have different idols. But the only idol, the only thing we should have is Jesus Christ. is our main center, our focus in our lives. But it said, uh, it said, don't be deceived with empty words because of these things. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So empty words are maybe those uh, TV preachers or different people that will tell you everything's just fine. Just speak positive thoughts. Do this, do that. And they leave out repentance. They leave out sin. They leave out all those kind of things. Everything's not fine. They're just kind of trying to put band-aids all over to make you feel good. Even the, the most common thing is we're talking about idolatry. Just use the Americans. We live in America, but it's all over the world. When you look at the, the marketing advertisement, everything is about self. It's all about me. It's like, how do I make myself feel better? What is going to be a better car for me? What's going to be a better product for me to use? It's all about me. Completely the opposite of what God tells us to live. God tells us to live for Him. He tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we're going to see later, He tells us to love our wives as ourselves for those who are married. And they... Uh, and that's what it's about, and the whole, the whole world scheme of things. It says in the Bible, it says to be friends with the world is to be an enemy of God. We can't be in the world and think all this stuff is fine and kosher and think that we're good with God at the same time. The relationship doesn't work out the right way. But it says here, it says, it says therefore do not become partners with them. So we've got to separate ourselves from that stuff. It says, for at one time... You were in darkness, but now you are in the light. Walk as children of light. You know, it says, it says in the Bible, we read about it before in 1 John, it said, In Him there is no darkness at all. And that said, there's actually a double negative. There's actually no, no darkness at all. In God, there's no sin. There's no wickedness. There's no darkness. And He hates that stuff. With a passion, He hates sin. He hates sin so bad, we were looking at Romans 5 this week. For if you really think about it, for one sin, the only sin that was possible in the Garden of Eden, he sent all of humanity into death and suffering. 
Well, that one sin, it said Eve was deceived, but Adam, he knew willingly. It didn't say Adam was deceived. Adam knew exactly that that was sin, and he chose to do it. And for that one sin that Adam did, it annihilated the entire human race. And think about that one sin. He ate a fruit from a tree. He was forbidden to eat. How many worse sins have all of us done? Every single one of us would have been in the same boat as Adam. We can't blame Adam. We would have all done the same thing against ourselves, given our nature right there, given... Not even, he may have had a sinful nature yet, but we would have done the same thing. But that's how much God hates that kind of stuff. And we've got to walk pure. We've got to follow Him. We've got to be holy as He is holy, it says in the Bible. And it says, it says we shouldn't become partners with these things. And it says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You know, it's hard. Sometimes we don't know what, what's right, what's wrong. We don't know what to do. You know, but we've got to try. We've got to give it some kind of effort. How do we try? By opening our Bibles, by reading the Word, by doing some kind of research, by looking at things, by fellowshipping with others around us right there. That's how we try. That's how we discern what's pleasing to the Lord. And uh, it says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. All right, here's the biggest, uh, biggest two verses anybody knows is John 3, 16, God loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son. And the second verse is Matthew 7, 1, Judge not, lest ye be judged. And He says here we should expose these sins right here. And to the world, they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's not what I want to talk about. about judge not, lest ye be judged. This is, talking, this is talking about for those within the church. If you read Matthew 18, it says that we're to, that we're to if someone's going astray, we're to discipline, we're to love them, we're supposed, supposed to go to them. Quietly be like, hey, you know, this is going on, this is what you're doing, and I don't think it's right with God. Do you think it's right with God? I mean, let's look at the scripture, and the guy says, no, and then you're supposed to go back with a buddy, and you're supposed to say, hey, this isn't right right here. This is what the Bible says. You know, you've got to change on this. We're praying for you. Do it in love and graciousness. And then if they don't listen, then the whole church is supposed to say to them, hey, sorry, if you don't change, you have to be out of here right here, because you can't be part of the body of believers in living in sin. Now, does that mean we don't let anybody that's not a Christian come to church? By no means. We want the unsaved here in, in Putler. I wish there was uh, 400 unsaved people here and all you guys that were saved right here amongst us. And that way they could all hear the preaching of the word. But to be a member of the body means that they're like taking part in ministry. They're doing things. They're serving right there. I want everybody. I want everybody from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 in the church right there. But in no ways are we going to tell them that your sin is okay, don't worry, just keep, keep it on and eventually you'll, you'll, you'll be okay and you'll figure it out. No, I'm going to talk about sin, I'm going to expose it from the pulpit, but I'm not going to point at them and be like, you sinner, you drunkard, you better quit drinking because that's it. No, you know, the first thing I want to do is I want to lead them to Jesus Christ. I want them to see the source of it all. I want them to be able to be filled with the Spirit, like that glove going on top of the hand, or oh, there's no way that they're going to be able to give up that sin that they've got. They've got to get God inside of them. And once God is inside of them, once they're part of the believing body right there, then we'll be able to help expose their sins to them, be able to help them, be able to help them draw them, and be able to push them on toward better things for them, and for the glory of God. But it says that, it tells us to walk as children of light. Anytime you see walk, it also means live, to live as godly people. You know, it's like I said the other week, you know, is, is that what a Christian would do? You know, that's what we have to be, like act like. When I said, I said that with the Marine Corps, if a Marine, a guy was down there on the ground and he was scared from fire head going over top of his head, and another sergeant would come up and be like, get up and act like a Marine. Be like a Marine. That's the way we should be as Christians. We should get up and act like Christians. Be like Christians. Not be some defeated failure that just constantly dwells in the darkness. We have power to get up and out of the darkness and to follow Christ. Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. It just keeps going on and on, repeating the same thing. And, uh, and, it, and uh, here's another story. That says, there's some guys that were in a cave. And they're trapped in a cave right there. And they can't get out of the cave. And finally, they see a little bit of light. And they walk toward that light. And they're moving their way. And they get out to the light. And they've been in the cave for months. And when they see the light, it bright so harsh in their eyes that they think, what is this that's happened to us right there? And they go back into the cave because they knew about some comforts in the cave. They kind of knew around where they had. They had the little area where they slept. They had the little way of procuring food and water. But they didn't know how to operate in the light, and therefore they went away from the light. And that's the same thing that happens every time in the world when we preach the gospel, when the Holy Spirit draws somebody, and somebody turns away from God right there and goes back into the darkness. They're going back for something that's so worthless. 
something that's so un unequatable with what the glory of God is, what God has to offer them, but yet they kind of know they're comfortable in their sin over here, and they'd rather come back to their sin than come and be exposed to God in His glory and, and walk in Him right there. And every one of us, we need to we need to adjust our eyes to the light, and we actually need more light. And when we get down, we're like, God, give me some more light. Show me some more truth right here. And uh, and if we when we see this here, it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit also. It says it's not the same filled with the Holy Spirit as it talks about in Acts chapter 2. It's a completely different word for the Greek word when they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and they all started speaking in tongues and all kinds of miraculous signs and miracles were happening. That's not the same being filled with the Holy Spirit that we're being commanded to be right here. That this, this, this being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that we do have somewhat of a part in right there. That being filled with the Holy Spirit, they didn't have any part of it. God came down and shook the house right there. And all kinds of things went on. This is the kind of being filled with the Holy Spirit that we're, 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 we're living for God. We're, we're, we're putting the glove on His hand. We're putting our life over Him. And He's the one that's operating us right here. That's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is. It's not the same as Acts chapter 2. And we're supposed to live in this being filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. Maybe miracles and great things and all kind of stuff isn't happening. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that we don't have God inside of us right there. And that's where we have to operate and live on this. God is inside of us. Be like that woman, the old woman in the house that had nothing at all. Be it she's totally content because she has Christ. She feels like she has the richest riches of the world because she has Jesus inside of her. And it tells us in the... It tells us in 16 to make the best use of our time and the days are evil. It says, do not be foolish. The Bible says the first thing about a fool is the fool says that there is no God. That's what the fool says. It talks about Proverbs. So any kind of atheist, anybody thinks they're a smart fella, until they come to recognize who God is, they're just a fool. And they're, they're number one fool in God's eyes right there because they say there is no God. And the days are evil and our time is ticking by. You know, we only have so much time. It says, that I believe that every one of us has an appointed time to die, but it also says in Ecclesiastes where it says that, it says, you fool, you die before your time. You know, we want to make the best of our time. We want to make it count. We don't want to do some foolish thing that we end up dying before the time that we should have died in right there. But when we follow Christ, we put Him first in all of our life, everything else is going to fall into place the right way. I promise you that right there. Maybe you won't, you know, not the right way is what the world would say the right way is, but definitely the right way as in what God would say the right way is. When you start to follow Jesus, our lives will fall into order in the proper way that it should always be. But it has to come first with Jesus Christ. It can't come first with trying to put our life in order and get to Jesus Christ. That'll never happen. That's impossible. So first we've got to put Jesus first above all things. And it says here, do not get drunk with wine in verse 18, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I looked about this wine thing, and I always thought, you know, everybody tries to twist the word wine to mean something different. It didn't really mean alcohol, some people say, but that's not really true. It really was like three or four different words for wine in the Bible. Wine in those days was something like 2% alcohol, not like, you know, 8%, 9%, something like that, what we have today. They had some heavier wines. They had paste. It was like cream, and it was like syrup. And that's the kind of wine that they had back then. In fact, if you look at it with the wine, there was actually, there was actually the, you, you, if you look from the fermentation of the wine, because you know that drunkenness is wrong. Everywhere we see in the Bible, drunkenness is total sin, terrible things happen. Uh, Lot's daughters have incest with Lot after Lot gets drunk. If they get their father drunk, Noah curses one of his sons after he gets drunk right there. I mean, whenever you see drunkenness, you see evil right there. You don't see any place where some guy was drunk and everything was just fine and chipper. So we know drunkenness is wrong. But whether they drink wine in a moderate fashion or not, it never says that that's wrong. It even tells us in some places to drink wine. Timothy, guy's stomach's hurting, he says, drink a little wine for your stomach. You know, another place says, uh, drink wine and be merry right there. So it talks about those kind of things. Jesus made some wine too, and he was at the, the thing and everything. But you think if drunkenness is a sin, God isn't making wine that's going to make them all drunk right there. It's not like the 10% fruit type stuff that we're drinking today or different things. It probably was like good, clean 2% stuff they had back then. But when we look at this with the wine, we have to think about, you know, when it says, it says, but be filled with the Spirit, and it's a debauchery. When we're drinking, or if you do a person to drink, do you sin when you drink? Does, does it take the edge off? Are you following God when you drink? Does it cause all kinds of things to go on that are not glorifying God? And even worse, it says, 
when it talks about sin, it says to this guy it might be sin, to that guy may not be sin. But if you drink in front of that guy who is sin, that's sin also. Because you're now making that guy weaker because he has a hard time where he can't just drink a drink or two. Now you're bringing him to the table of sin himself. So now you're sinning that you're doing that. So for me, there's other reasons too. I don't drink a drop. But for one thing, I don't want to ever drink somebody else into sin right there. I don't want someone else to think... Well, you know, the pastor drinks, so I can drink too. And next thing you know, you're drinking a six-pack of beer or a 12-pack at night. And you're thinking, it's okay, the pastor drinks too. He said he drinks once in a while. That's not going to be. I don't drink a drop. I gave up drinking in January 2010. The last time I had a drink, I'm never going to have a drink ever again. Just decided that, you know, one day. But that's, and there's, to me, it's a much safer side to be that. But it's definitely a sin to be drunk. You know, it's a, 1 Corinthians 6 9 include drunkards are the ones on the way to hell right there. And uh, here, it talks about, it says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's put that glove on so that we can live righteously. We can live right and we have the Holy Spirit inside us and we're walking the right way. And it says to address one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, and make a melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything. This is the kind of attitude we're supposed to have, one of thankfulness, one of giving praise to God, one of a, making a new song within our heart. Let that song come out right there. You know, when you look in the Bible, you see that if we read the book of Psalms and look at King David and look at different things, they sing songs to God. It said uh, when they were down and they were burdened and times were tough, they would sing a song. They would all get chipper. They would all get happy right there. It would fill them up. It would, it would help them out right there. So we should, we should sing some songs. And even if you can't sing at all, just sing by yourself or something like that. Sing a song to God right there sometime when you're worshiping and when you're in your prayer time. Let that song come out because it, we're, it's, it says here, it says we should be singing a melody to the Lord. It's not something that's like a maybe. It's not something like God said you can do this and you could do that. He's telling us this for all of us right here. That we're all mankind, we're all human beings. This is for every one of us. And we got to remember to give thanks for always. And then as we get into the wife and husband chat section right here. We see it says it's submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So not only when we hit submit with how women should submit, we also hit submit as we should submit to one another. We should all submit to God and His headship right there. And uh, this is where we'll uh, we'll go into here. And uh, that, that that's verse 21 says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here's a thing that puts it more picture clear, I think. If, if we have no desire to submit to God, it probably equals no salvation in our life. If we don't want to submit ourselves under God's authority, we're probably not saved. We're probably on the way to hell, and we're definitely not following God the way it is. We need to submit to Him. If we don't have a desire to submit to God, then there's a serious spiritual problem that's going on in our own lives. We need to be always submit to Him. If, if we're not, and we have an issue with it, Talk to me, I'll pray for you, I'll help you, I'll guide you, talk to other brothers in Christ, but most importantly, seek Jesus. But here it says, it says, uh, verse 22, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and it is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And verse 33 sums up the entire passage. We should love Everybody should, all the men should love their wives as they love themselves, and every woman should respect her husband. And many times, when you talk about this in the forum, sometimes even in the Christian forum, people are like, well, I'm not respecting him because he's not showing me the love I need. That's a completely ungodly principle. Nowhere do we see that. We see Jesus saying, turn the other cheek. We see Jesus saying, do this. He's not a conditional thing saying, well, if he doesn't love you, then you won't respect him or you won't submit to him. That is not God's word right there. That's that sinful evil inside of us 
trying to get out and justify our sin right there. Every one of us has fallen. And when we follow God and we seek Him and we search Him the way we're supposed to, things change. You know, if you're married to an unsaved person, they may get saved, the Bible says. You know, it says stay with them. You know, if they want to leave you, then let them leave you. But if they, if they do, staying with them is going to help, help the process go on right there. May lead them to salvation right there. And the same, in the same way, when it talks about men, you know, maybe a man's like, I'm not going to love my wife because she shows me no respect, this and that. He doesn't have an option for that either, in any case. If we look at this, that we're supposed to love our wife as, as, as we love ourselves, we're supposed to love as Christ loved the church. Think about that. God just kept giving and giving and giving to the church. Think about the book of Hosea where he calls the whole church, the, his people are the adulterous people. And he makes Hosea marry a prostitute, knowing she'll be unfaithful to him, to show, him, to show all the people that this, I am married to an unfaithful people. Because as we sin, as we stray from God, we are unfaithful to God. And yet God keeps loving us. He keeps drawing us. He keeps forgiving us. He keeps making up. There's always a remnant that's saved right there. Every time as you look to the Old Testament. And there's, there's a story of a, of a guy and he, he talks to a chaplain. The same chaplain that was in that other story. This chaplain is a very handy chaplain. He talks to this other guy and he says, he says to him, I don't know, I'm too worried. I may be loving my wife too much. And the chaplain says, and the chaplain says, do you think that Christ loves the church too much? He said, no. And he goes, well, therefore, you don't love your wife enough. So just keep loving your wife more. And I thought, that's some good, handy advice right there. And use it in marriage counseling, different things, too, I think, for, for premarital counseling, whatever. I think that's excellent right there. But, uh, but even, even Napoleon, when he, we're talking about conflict and we're talking about wives and husbands, he, Napoleon had this saying that every battle moment that comes down to 10 to 15 minutes, the entire battle. Think about Napoleon, if you study history, he took over a lot of countries right there. He was a great general, great warrior. They made him like the super king of, of France and everything until, until he started going crazy. But he, but he was a very good warrior. He knew his army skills. He knew stuff. He said every battle has a concise point of 10 to 15 minutes. And think about that. Are you going to be ready at that point in your life or in your marriage or wherever when it's down to that concise, short point in time to push through that and make it through it or not? And he said, if you don't, 10 to 15 minutes and you'll lose the whole battle. It's all about that crucial bit of time. And you can apply that to your own lives as well. Even if you're not married, there's always something that we can apply that to. Can, are we going to push through and are we going to make it? through the tough 10 to 15 minutes that comes down into our lives, or maybe it's a few months or something in the space of eternity, kind of like 10 or 15 minutes, are we going to push through that tough time or not? And uh, then we also see as we're talking about submission, it talks about, you know, first of all, let me point out, submission does not mean being a doormat, does not mean being used. It talks about in the Bible in Galatians 3.28 that in God's eyes we're all equal. It says he doesn't have Jew or Gentile. He doesn't see female or male. He sees us as all the same. And when it talks about this to wives to submit, it's not talking about to submit to other men. It's talking about to your husband. It's not talking that a woman has to be submitting to all men in society by no means whatsoever. You don't have to submit to any man except for Jesus Christ and your husband right there. And that's what the Bible is talking about. It doesn't, doesn't say that. That's why... So many times we have such a busy world and things are so expensive and sometimes women have to work and men have to work. And when a woman has to work, now she's having to submit herself under some other man more than likely with different things. And that causes more stress because it's not the man of her husband right there she's submitting on to. And that could start making some things different there. And it tells us, and if we really look at submission, we see Jesus is in submission to the Father. And yet we know that it's Father, Son, Holy Ghost. One perfect trinity. But yet the Son submits to the Father. The Son puts Himself in submission to the Father. That doesn't make the Son less equal than the Father right there. We believe in one God, one Lord, the first commandment says right there. So we see that God, that Jesus willingly submits to the Father. Why? Because there's a natural order of things. If you think about it, here's a football team story. All right, this football coach, everybody's mad at him. He says he's from the Cleveland Browns. It happens a lot up here. Everybody's mad at the Cleveland Browns football coach. They're like, why aren't we winning this? And that's the Cleveland Browns football coach thinks, you know what? I like to, to drink, uh, drink, uh, drink soda, not beer. It's a dumb hot being drunk. Eat chips and watch sports on TV. That's what I'm going to go do because that's what I like to do. 
And you, quarterback, you like to run that ball all the way through, you do what you want to do. And you run it back, you like to do what you do, you do what you want to do. Everybody just do what they think is right in their own eyes. Just go ahead and do it. And I, as the coach, just going to sit here and eat my chips, too. Well, the team goes out to play. Crazy stuff got going on. They're losing. The, the kicker, whoever he is, I'm not sure who the kicker is, but he decides, you know what, there's a strong head when I'm not going to kick it between the goals, but I can kick it this way real good. He kicks it this way, and it goes in the audience, and they get a penalty point or something because the guy didn't even do the right thing. It was blatantly the wrong way, and all this madness is going on. And why is it? Because there's no authority, there's no order, there's no semblance of anything. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. God has given us the picture right here, has outlined it out. And it's and not just a picture, it's God's word, it's perfect right there. And this is the way it's to be. It's supposed to be, the husband is supposed to be taking care of his wife. He's supposed to be loving his wife, he's supposed to be providing for her. It says in the Bible too, it says, He that doesn't provide for his wife is worse than an infidel. Worse than an unbeliever. Infidel really came from, from our Christianity. It didn't come from the Muslims, even though they all call us infidels. It came from the Bible right there. And that is you're worse than infidel if you don't provide for your family right there. You know, so men need to get up and work. They need to be that standing authority in their family, in their household. And, the, and women need to respect that man. And both of them are always going to be at odds. We're always in fiction because men and women are so totally differently made up. It's just like the way I think that the marriage relationship is perfect to the relationship we have with God. We're always in conflict with God. We're always like, we've got some sin dragging us down, this or that. We have to get right, get fixed with God. Same way with the marriage. We're always going to be butting heads. We're never going to see eye to eye. It's like, guys, I heard one guy say, he said, ladies, if you're single, get married. Men, if you're single, get married. It's God's way. It's what it should be. He said, he said ladies, don't wait for your Prince Charming because he's never going to come. Men, don't wait for this woman who's going to like be some incredible supermodel, this and that, and because she's never going to come. You know, find who you have desires for, find who you get along with, and get married right there, because it's God's plan right there. And that, that really is the truth. You know, nobody, you know, people talk about soulmates and different things like that. The Bible really doesn't elude anything to soulmates and things like that. It eludes love and it eludes a relationship that you must take decisions, you must work together. It says you leave your father and your mother and you hold fast to your wife and the two shall become one flesh. And that's repeated from Genesis 2. This is God's picture, his picture of summing everything up right there. And this, if you look at it too, as a, as a husband loves his wife, as Christ loves the church. And just think of the magnitude of that. It's like that story I told about that guy. He goes, do you love your wife as much as Jesus loves the church? No. Well, then you don't love her enough. Keep loving her more. This is the magnitude. This is the commandment that we're to have, that we're to step out and that we're to believe and that we're to walk in right there. And uh, I have a few notes right here before I sum this up. Is uh, Joni Erickson Tata. I don't know how many of you guys know her, but she's a quadriplegic lady, and she's a teacher of God's Word. She uh, talks on the uh, radio sometimes, different things. But she's, she has a saying, that giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful. You know, when we, we're being thankful, it's not a matter of feeling thankful. we got to take the feelings and get rid of them right there. Okay? Yeah, we are emotional, we're feelings and stuff, but we can't let our feelings guide us. We need to be guided by the wisdom of God's Word and His truth. She says, giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful, it's a matter of obedience. It's obedient. We're supposed to give thanks. Like when we pray, if you notice, whenever I pray, when you look at the prayers in the Bible, they start off with giving thanks to God. You don't start off with saying, God, why did you do this? God, this is so awful. God, I want this. God, I have my whole list of wants. I'm going to read my list of wants to you, God. No, it's a thing of thankfulness, praising Him, giving Him glory and things. There's nothing wrong with asking God for things too. But that shouldn't be the whole subject of your prayer. Is that it's all about me, me, me. It should be about other things. It should be about spreading the gospel. It should be for correcting your relationship with God. There's many things that should be involved with prayer. And uh, Billy Graham had a saying too. He said, if two people agree on everything, one is not necessary. All right, that's kind of a funny saying, but it's a good one, right? You think if a husband and wife agreed on everything they said, then what is the necessary? One of them doesn't need to be there, you know? And really, that's also the, the, one of the hardest points in marriage, I told people before they get married, is, is you both had your own ways you were going before, making your own decisions when you get married. It's two people trying to figure out one way together, because when you're living life together, you can't always live it separate ways, you're actually supposed to live it the same way together. 
But at the same time, what Billy Grant says is totally true. If two people agree on everything, one's not necessary. So I, I like that. And, uh, and then we need to look at, uh, at the, the, Jesus is the light, and he's, he's the light of everything. Je Jesus is our all in all, the, the, you know, the, he is everything completely to us right there. And I know this is a hard chapter right here about women submitting and things like that. It talks about it though too, like some people could even get technical and be like, it really doesn't even say the word submit in verse 22 in the real text, but that's what it means. And if you go to another verse right there, Colossians 3.18, it says submit right there. So, so it's backed up by someplace else, so we can't word it out. And if we look real quick for one more example, at 1 Peter 3, 5 through 7. 1 Peter 3, 5 through 7. It's so actually 1 through 7 is great, but we're just going to read 5 through 7. It says, For this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightful. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, and that weaker vessel doesn't mean that like your woman's weaker than you. It means like she's physically weaker than you. Most guys are a little bit stronger than ladies are. It's talking about like how you're supposed to be that leader of your family, the headship, and you know, as Jesus is headship of the church. It's and say like I've said, I said, we gotta always remember Galatians three twenty eight. It says we're all equal in God's eyes, you know, men and women. He doesn't see a difference between the two of us right there. So there's another thing, and it gives Sarah as an example all the way back in Genesis how how she submitted to Abraham. And we can look at Sarah's relationship. First, she laughed at Abraham and laughed at God. Remember, she wasn't perfect either. Just like none of us are perfect right there. But it does use her for an example in that way that she did. So, if you guys will uh, bow your heads, we'll go ahead and we'll close in prayer. Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, for this time we got to be together, Lord, for, for me getting to share your word. Lord, I ask that you open up the ears and let, let people hear what you're saying, Lord Jesus, through your word. And Lord, open up their eyes so they can see before them what's going on. And Lord, help us not to be like the man in the mirror it talks about in James, where we see your truth, we see your clarity, and then immediately we walk away from the mirror and completely forgot what we just saw. But Lord, let us stick with us. Let us stay home to you. Let us hold you as number one above all things in our life at all times, Lord Jesus. And Lord, if there be anyone here today that doesn't know you, doesn't have this personal relationship, that doesn't have you as their all in all, and maybe they have other idols or different things that are their gods controlling them other than you. Lord, give them the strength. Draw them by your Holy Spirit. Pull them to you and show them your salvation. Lord, bring them to repentance of their sin and to knowledge of you and let your light shine in their life just so fully and so brilliantly that it will cover up every bit of darkness that's within, Lord Jesus, that your light would shine, that you would use all things together, the good and the bad, for your glory, for your good, Lord, that you'll bring them to the point now with their sin or whatever is dragging them down, that they would repent, that they would realize that this just is not working out. There is no thankfulness to be had in the lifestyle I'm living if it's not a lifestyle that lifts you up, Lord Jesus. And let them repent and follow you, Lord. I praise your name and I thank you. And Lord, this week as we do our outreaches and our evangelism, I ask you we would walk right across many, many people and that you would open up their ears and open up their eyes, that they would be able to see your truth, Lord, that we'd be able to preach your gospel to them, share your word with them, and see people's lives change for an eternity, Lord God. And Lord, I also ask that you protect us and watch over us as we're out there and about and doing your work, Lord. And we ask that you do draw all men unto you, Lord, and help us to be obedient and faithful to you in your call. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now we got this potluck going on right here.